This is experiment two of Make Electronic Second Edition by Charles Platt. And uh, our experiment today is called Let's Abuse a Battery. And so since we're going to abuse some batteries, you're going to need at least two, uh, one to abuse and one hopefully to protect uh, AA batteries, nice and fresh. And for the protection part, we're going to explore how that works uh, using a fuse. Uh, these are three amp fuses uh, chosen very specifically for the kit. If you're taking the audio version of the class, you may not have received fuses in the kit and you won't be able to do that part of the laboratory today. You'll also be needing a couple of the alligator clips. Um, test leads with alligator clips at both ends that were um, in your kits, as well as one AA battery holder with a couple leads coming off of it. Um, beyond that, there's something very important uh, that you definitely need for today's experiment. First of all, do not do this experiment with more than a one and a half volt AA battery. Do not use a D cell. Do not use a car battery for sure. And certainly uh, don't use a nine volt battery or your wall outlet. Um, we are going to be heating up a battery uh, till it damages and that carries with it a small risk of a leak or an explosion. And therefore you should also find some safety glasses and put those on before doing today's laboratory. Grab your voltmeter if you have it. Let's do a quick check of our battery to begin with. It's a nine volt battery, so in my manual ranging meter, I want to hit the 20 volt DC measurement. Checking my battery out, it should read uh, zero volts, whether or not the leads are touching. With the battery uh, mounted into the strap, let's um, connect the leads. Again, they are in the common and volts, uh, pro volts. Check the tutorial on voltmeters if you have a different meter than mine. And uh, we're just going to check our battery's voltage. And uh, most brand new batteries uh, will ship with a voltage a little bit higher than rated, of course, for a AA battery, such as this one, it's 1 1.5 volts, and see mine is 1.61. Keep that in mind. All right, uh, now making sure we've got our safety glasses on, we're going to attach the two wires of the battery together. Again, only do this with a AA, and uh, never with a battery over one and a half volts. And in general, this is something we want to avoid doing. Verify that your battery is nice and cold uh, to begin with, and that there's nothing real flammable, flammable right next to it. Okay, twist and leads together. Just the metal ends, but making sure that they really do touch and are wrapped up. Can be a little tricky if you have short leads like these. You want to get them twisted up enough to where you don't have to hang on to them to keep it together. And now we're just going to wait for a bit. Occasionally touch, feel it. It's getting maybe a little warm. We'll just wait a little. A little warmer. The leads are starting to get quite hot. Don't burn yourself by holding too long or too hard, but definitely feel the leads getting hot. The battery is starting to warm. We're approaching about a minute since I have connected the leads. Now the leads are extremely hot. Barely touch them. Battery is continuing to get quite warm. So let it go just a few more seconds. According to the textbook, the heat's caused by electricity flowing through the wires and through the electrolyte or the conductive fluid inside the battery. 
and it uses the analogy that if you've ever used a hand pump to force air into a bicycle tire, you know the pump also gets warm, and that electricity behaves in much the same way. So if you imagine electricity being composed of particles that make the wire hot as they push through it, you would imagine uh, that the same thing's happening here. And just like the bike pump, these wires are getting warm. Okay, we've been almost two minutes now. Uh, book calls for you to do it for at least a minute. And we're going to try to stop things safely by separating leads. Everything's quite hot now. The battery especially is warm and staying quite warm. The leads cool quickly. Let's go back and check. The voltage. We've seen we have significantly fallen from 1.61 to 1.36 volts DC in the space of just two minutes. This battery pretty soon wouldn't be able to uh, serve its intended purpose of powering devices that need about one and a half volts to operate. Our experience with the battery leads us to a physical model called the water flow model for electrical current. If a reservoir of water is like a battery that isn't being refilled but just sits in your hand and then you put a huge hole in the side of the tank draining all the water out by shorting the red and black leads of the battery or battery carrier, pretty soon all the charge drains out and the voltage uh, disappears to almost nothing. You could imagine that a large enough hole with a big enough reservoir could be quite dangerous. And that's the reason we use fuses to protect high power electrical circuits. Grab our leads. Make sure you get the metal part connected by the alligator clip. And then we're once again going to short out the battery, but this time going through the fuse. All right. And the back clip to this end. Zoom in on it. We're about to hook up the circuit. And very quickly thereafter, the fuse blows. Let's look at it here in slow motion in real life. Notice how the fuse went from being intact to being separated. That brief glow in the middle. Let's watch that real slowed down a couple times. The fuse is a specially designed material that when it gets hot from the electricity flowing through it too rapidly due to a short circuit, it melts, creating that glow and then the separation of the wires inside the fuse. Once the wires have come apart, electricity will no longer flow and the circuit is protected 
course, it's not just the circuit, but potentially people who might be holding on to equipment that's powered by the fuse, especially important in the case of the high power available through our electrical wall outlets. In all modern homes, we use circuit breakers, which effectively are the same as going back and replacing the fuse. Again, the idea is that the fuse damages instead of anything else connected because we've inadvertently through a short circuit put a huge hole in the tank reservoir. If you're having trouble getting your fuse to blow, don't worry too much. Uh, sometimes it can be due to the thin leads or your battery not quite being completely fresh. However, you should notice that the use of the fuse typically does prevent your battery from draining as quickly as it would have otherwise. Let's take a look at the two fuses in our kits. First, the one we just used, which we find uh, is uh, open because it's broken, and then a brand new one, uh, which you haven't used yet, which you find gives a resistance of about zero ohms, same as a piece of wire, or touching the two probes together. So the one that has been used is now open, and the one that has not been blown is still a short. Moving to voltage mode, let's check our battery voltage. First of all, the battery we drained without a fuse, we see is reading less than 1.5 volts. And if we go to the one in the strap, again with our voltmeters in volt mode, and attach it using uh, the battery strap leads. So this is when it was protected by the fuse. we find that it's still up over 1.5 volts, hasn't lost too much, uh, despite the fuse uh, getting warm and blowing uh, from the same battery. When you're repeating experiment two's measurements, uh, don't be disappointed if you have a hard time getting the fuse to blow again. That can be a difficult thing uh, for many students, particularly if the battery isn't fresh or uh, if your battery carrier uh, just isn't quite up to the task of carrying enough uh, current to make it happen. That's why I left you lots of nice videos uh, watching the fuse blow on your own. I would, however, like you to investigate fuses around you in everyday life, starting with taking apart uh, your digital multimeter again and removing the fuse. Um, I just pointed at it in the unboxing video. Remove the fuse and then write down. It um, usually has a voltage and a current rating um, stamped on it, or maybe some other number you can look up online. If you need to order a couple of extra fuses, there is a chance in the coming weeks that we will be blowing them. Uh, so go to a, a uh, hardware store, or uh, if you prefer, order online and get yourself a couple of extra fuses. Should not cost uh, very much. Um, document which fuse you have in your logbook, and then go look around your house for various other appliances um, which have a current rating on them some number of amps or amperes or simply uh, written with an A and uh, identify a couple of devices and think about whether or not you think that those appliances have fuses. You might also think if you've ever actually, quote, blown a fuse or really popped a circuit breaker uh, in your home while using that device or appliance or not. Try to find ones that maybe a couple different ranges, something that you think draws a lot of current is a big, powerful device. Uh, like a vacuum cleaner uh, or a microwave oven. You can look on the back of those appliances to find them. Or maybe it's a um, smaller thing like a telephone charger. 
finally, do spend some time playing with the DC circuit simulator, putting in some fuses, and go ahead and jump ahead and you know light some light bulbs and uh, uh, throw some resistors around. Just uh, get familiar playing with the simulation. It's uh, uh, one of uh, four or five different simulation packages we're going to use here during the course and probably the easiest to use.